Let's turn in the Bible to the book of 2 Timothy. If you're using a Pew Bible, that's page 1267. One of the ways you can find uh, the letter of 2 Timothy is you can remember that after Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, there are five letters of Paul that all start with the letter T, and they're clustered together right after Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. So then you have First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, and Titus. Those are the only letters of Paul that start with T, and they're all together. So if you can find the T's, then you'll find Second uh, Timothy more easily. We are beginning a new sermon series today on the awesome and relevant second letter of Paul to Timothy, which is going to take us all the way to Palm Sunday, March 24th. Having looked at 1 Timothy this fall, we saw there Paul's instructions to a younger pastor on how to order a local church so that it's a healthy church and a faithful church. In 2 Timothy, we come to a letter that builds on the first one, but has a different focus. And it's understandable why 2 Timothy has a different focus than 1 Timothy. The circumstances of Paul's life have changed when he writes 2 Timothy. Some years have passed since he wrote 1 Timothy. When Paul wrote 1 Timothy, he was moving around freely, traveling with his companions from city to city, preaching the gospel, planting churches. The churches were growing, and a future still appeared to lay ahead of the apostle. On the other hand, when Paul writes 2 Timothy, he is now wasting away in a gloomy Roman prison, mostly alone. Having been abandoned, he's going to tell us, by many of his former companions, And he's facing certain death. 2 Timothy is a letter from death row. It's a letter that has the smell of death hanging all over it. It's a letter from a man who knows his time has come. And who is leaving behind a situation that from a human perspective is less than ideal. Consequently, the purpose of the letter is different. In 1 Timothy, Paul writes concerning the church in Ephesus. He wants Timothy to tend to that church, to get them praying, to get them to stop heeding false teachers, to ordain elders, to order their ministries so that their ministries will be healthy and life-giving. The focus of 1 Timothy is the local church. But here in 2 Timothy, the focus is not the local church, but Timothy himself. The letter is about the kind of man that Timothy needs to be. It's about the courage and the faithfulness that is required of him to fulfill the work that he is being called to do. The aged Paul writes to strengthen this young man who will be assuming the great responsibility of carrying on the apostle's work after he is gone. 2 Timothy is the last letter of Paul that we possess. And that alone gives it a special importance. Given that he writes to his successor, preparing him to take the baton and run, we ought to lean forward and pay careful attention to this letter. The famous theologian John Stott wrote that in order to feel the full force of this remarkable letter, we have to realize three things. First, as I've said, Paul writes from death row. Second, as I've said, he writes to Timothy, his successor, who was a gifted young man, but, and I quote John Stott, he was being thrust into a position of responsible, of responsible Christian leadership far beyond his natural capacity. And we'll see this as we look at 2 Timothy. He's a young man. And it appears from the letter that Timothy also is somewhat of a fearful, timid, 
person by disposition. That's what he struggles with. And so he's now being given a great responsibility beyond his natural capacity. And thirdly, the gospel of Jesus Christ was at stake. Paul had been entrusted by God with the preservation and proclamation of nothing less than the gospel of God. And now he is entrusting the same to Timothy, a young man, unlike many young men, who seems to be aware of the fact that he is a young man. The situation hardly inspires confidence. When you put those three factors together, the gospel's at stake, Paul is dying, and this huge responsibility is being given to this young man, you get a, a sense of the mood of 2 Timothy. This is huge. It's highly personal, it's enormously important, and there's so much that speaks to us, which we can learn and apply as we will journey through this amazing letter. Because, brothers and sisters, the Christian church in every generation faces the same task and the same challenges. The gospel must be preserved and proclaimed in our generation, and it must be passed whole and entire to the next generation, who will likewise need to preserve it and proclaim it and pass it on again. And as we know, from ourselves and as we look around, this is no easy task. We can feel like Timothy, the young man, we're not up to it. But each generation is an essential link in the chain that must not be broken. You know, and just as the situation of Paul in his day was not looking good, false teachers on the rise, people seemed more interested in hearing what they wanted to hear than really what was true, persecution looming. So in our time, we are facing our own massive challenges. And like Timothy, we can be tempted to fear and to discouragement. Things didn't look good in 64 AD. But just as Paul wrote to strengthen Timothy and steady his heart for the work before him, assuring him of Christ's rule and conquest and urging him to faithfulness, we also need to hear the instruction of this book in 2024 and beyond. And that's what this series is all about. So I'm really excited that we're in 2 Timothy at this time and we're moving forward with it. So this is going to be, I think, a very helpful next few months in God's Word. And I hope that uh, you lean into this and you listen well and respond to what God is saying to us. So let's read 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, our first passage, and then I'll pray, and we'll begin to look at this passage. We'll look at it in three steps. And what we're going to see here in this opening passage, at the beginning of this letter, is that the Lord gives courage to his people so that they will fulfill their calling to live lives of gospel faithfulness. The Lord gives courage to his people so that they will fulfill their calling to live lives of gospel faithfulness. Let's read verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 
Let's pray and ask God to help us now. Lord, we thank you for your word, which you have given to us. We thank you for this amazing letter. We ask now, Lord, that what you intend to say to us through this letter and through this passage, you would help us to hear it. And more than that, Lord, you would help us to digest it and to be changed by it. Help us, Lord, not to listen uh, and let these words fall upon deaf ears. Lord, help us to hear not my voice, not even Paul's voice, but to hear your voice. For, Lord, it is by your voice and your word that we live. Help us now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Number one, Christians need encouragement to live lives of gospel faithfulness. <laughs> Amen? I know I do. And we see here that Timothy did. The word encouragement literally means to put courage into someone. To encourage them. To put courage into someone. Courage is, I quote, the mental or moral strength to venture, persevere, and withstand danger, fear, and difficulty. There are so many stories that we could read of ordinary people demonstrating incredible courage in the face of danger. I read about a woman this week from Australia who was on the beach one day and just enjoying the beach, and all of a sudden she heard another woman screaming because this other woman's two young boys were being swept away by a riptide in the ocean, and she was screaming. And there was about 100 other people on the beach, and the, and the woman was hearing the screaming and looking around, seeing the boys, and noticing that nobody was doing anything. 100 people on the beach, and no one was doing anything. And so this woman dove into the water and grabbed those boys and began swimming back to the shore, of course, struggling herself. And thankfully, somebody else started to help her, and they managed to save the lives of those two boys. And the amazing thing is, is that this woman was eight months pregnant. Astounding. Obviously, you need to have mental and moral courage in a moment like that, and it was severely lacking on that beach that day. But I wonder if the courage necessary to act suddenly like that in a moment of crisis is as difficult as the courage necessary to face a prolonged test of mental and moral endurance, which is just so much harder because you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And when you feel like you don't have the strength to keep on going, and when all the world around you scorns you and ridicules you the whole way, and when the threats on your life feel so big and so real. Because it's something more like that latter situation that as Christians we face and that as Timothy we were, he was facing. Not a, not a sudden moment of crisis where you have to just act quick and then it's over in a few seconds. But we need courage for the, the long haul. Timothy was facing such a trial, and so will all Christians who desire to live lives of gospel faithfulness. We are called to persevere and to preach the gospel during our time. Within a world that despised and rejected and crucified the Lord who we proclaim and whom we worship. Christians around the world constantly face social ostracism, and the real possibility of economic and physical harm for being faithful to the gospel. And there are seasons when it seems like unfaithfulness is the trend of the day within churches. Churches abandoning their charge in order to curry favor with the world. It can feel like everything is against those who desire to be faithful to the gospel. And when you look inside, you may not feel much better. And we can be tempted to fear and discouragement. Look at verse 7. Because Paul has to remind Timothy, Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear. 
showing us that Timothy struggled with that. Real Christians, yes, real Christians experience fear and discouragement and need courage from God. There's a reason that the Bible tells us to encourage the faint-hearted and to lift up the drooping hands and to strengthen the weak knees. We are called as God's people to extraordinary things, to believe and live out difficult and dangerous things. And given all the challenges that we face, we, like Timothy, need to be encouraged. And brothers and sisters, this encouragement, this giving of courage to us is absolutely essential if we're going to live out the calling that God has given to us. We have to be encouraged. We're going to need encouragement. Don't think that we can do this without encouragement. Secondly, we see from this passage that the Lord gives courage to his people. And he does this by confirming them in his grace. By confirming them in his grace. And I want us to notice something this morning that I don't want us to forget as we go on through this entire series. The letter of 2 Timothy is framed and bracketed and punctuated by the grace of God. Look again at verse 2. Right at the beginning of the letter, Paul says to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And then look at the end of the letter. Turn with me to the last verse, 2 Timothy 4, 22. And you can see how Paul has framed and, bra and bracketed this letter. He says at the very end in verse 22, The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. So at the beginning, grace be with you. At the end, grace be with you. And then look at first, uh, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and the first verse. And there's many other places we could go here, but I'll just show you this important verse. Paul tells Timothy, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What strengthens us is grace. I think if you've lived as a Christian for some time, you will know the truth of those words. What strengthens us more than anything else as Christians it's not getting yelled at. It's not simply being instructed. It's not threatened, being threatened. It is the grace of God. The grace of God is the favor of God upon our lives, which is given to us in Christ Jesus based upon his atoning work on the cross for us and not based upon our own worthiness, or what we deserve. In fact, none of us, non-Christian and Christian alike, deserves God's favor, or his approval, or his acceptance, or his companionship. Left to ourselves, we deserve the opposite, his disapproval. That's what we deserve. His condemnation, his rejection, if we think about it, this is what we deserve. But through God's free and undeserved kindness, he has given to this world Jesus Christ, his son, who bore the condemnation for our sins on the cross and rose from the dead so that whoever believes in him can be united to him and receive the complete favor of God, having all your sins removed, receiving God's righteousness and approval through Christ, and thereby receiving his complete favor in your life as an unspeakable gift. What you and I long for the most, friends, what we long for the most deeply and need the most truly is God's favor and grace. And this is what he provided for us through his son freely, 
contrary to how we feel, and I know we don't feel this, do we? Or I know that we do feel that we have to earn it. But contrary to how we feel, the Bible tells us that we do not have to earn God's favor. We don't have to be worthy of it. It is an astonishing gift from God, paid in full by the blood of Christ, which we may believe in and receive with great thanksgiving and rejoicing. And having received God's grace, we now learn how to live in the favor of God as beloved and accepted sons and daughters in Christ with hope and with love and giving glory to his name and with the confidence that he is with us. That's Christianity. It is this good news of the grace of God, grace which begins and carries and completes the Christian life from first to last. That's what Christianity is all about. And it is through grace that we know that God is with us and that he will never leave us nor forsake us and that he will bring us safely to his heavenly kingdom. Listen, without grace, we would have no assurance that God will be with us and that all our struggle will in the end turn out all right and be worth it. It is only because of the grace of God and the God of grace that we can know the Lord is with us and knowing he is with us, we can endure anything. So God gives courage to our fainting hearts by confirming us in his grace. And you know what the most common method is which God uses to confirm us in his grace? It is his word. It is his word communicated to God's people by God's people. That's the most common way that God confirms us in his grace. By his word communicated to God's people through God's people. Do you remember what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4? If you want to turn there with me, you can. In Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 16, Paul writes this. About the, risen, about the risen Lord who died for us and rose again and now blesses his people. He says this. And Christ gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds or pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, instead of being tossed about, speaking the truth in love, We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint which it is equipped, with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Wow, what an awesome picture of life. Sign me up for that, right? That's what I want to be a part of in life. That's what I want to be a part of in the church. That's what God intends for us. And that is how we are built up. That is how we are strengthened. The nourishing word of God's grace is communicated from Christ the head to his body. It flows through the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers, and through the whole body of Christ who in turn are to nourish one another and build one another up by speaking the truth in love to each other. You imagine a community like that, a body of believers like that, receiving the nourishment of God's grace, the word of his grace, and sharing it amongst one another, being strengthened together. That's what God has for us. In other words, Christ builds up and encourages his body through his body. 
Brother, do not underestimate the effect of your words on others. Sister, do not fail to offer that word of encouragement when you feel prompted or stirred to do so. It is just through this that God normally works to put courage into his people. And I'm sure each and every one of us could give a testimony, right? Of a time that we were discouraged, maybe many times. And the thing that got you through, the thing that strengthened you, the thing that carried you was the word of God, not just simply another person, the word of God, but being spoken to you through your brother and your sister. And this is exactly what we see Paul doing. We just need to kind of step back and consider what 2 Timothy is as a whole. This is exactly what we see Paul doing for Timothy by writing this very letter and by reminding Timothy of the grace of God. Paul was putting courage into Timothy and was strengthening him for the battle ahead. All of it reminds me of Moses when he's commissioning Joshua just before Moses is going to die. And he says, he says Joshua, be strong and very courageous for the Lord your God will be with you. Those words that Moses said to Joshua carried Joshua through his challenges. And let's turn back to 2 Timothy and look at how Paul encourages Timothy in these opening verses. In verse 1, Paul tells Timothy... I'm writing to you as an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. You see, we speak the word of God to, another, to one another, not, well, this is what I think. No, this is God's word. I'm encouraging you with the very word of God. This is what he says. Timothy, I'm writing to you as an apostle with Christ's very authority and his message. Listen to me, Timothy, and take courage. And he reminds Timothy of the promise of life in verse 1. That is in Christ Jesus, the beautiful, glorious life purchased by Christ that belongs to all who believe. He's, he's reminding Timothy of this wonderful promise to keep his eyes on it. And in verse 2, look there with me. He says to Timothy, my beloved child. He reminds Timothy that he is loved dearly. Loved for Christ's sake. And that likewise God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ are full of grace and mercy and peace towards him. I don't know about you, but I need to hear my brothers and sisters remind me of that on a regular basis. Please come and tell me, brother, you are loved. Brother, there is grace and mercy and peace for you in God, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, do we forget that. Verse 3, look what he does here. He encourages Timothy that he is remembered and not forgotten. Brother, I remember you every time I pray for you, and I pray for you night and day. I'm praying for you. I give thanks to God for you. Because Paul sees God's work and God's hand in Timothy's life, and he encourages him with that. He encourages him again that the gospel which you and I preach, he says, is consistent with the ancient faith of Israel. We're not preaching novelties here, and we're not being deceptive. We preach with a clear conscience, don't we, Timothy? He's encouraging him. In verse 4, Paul encourages Timothy that he is greatly desired. He says, I long to be with you, and I remember your tears. You are greatly desired, and your tears are not forgotten. In verse 5, Paul encourages Timothy by reminding him of the godly people that he learned the faith from, his grandmother and his mother. And he encourages him by expressing confidence that Timothy himself is a sincere believer. Brother, I know that you believe. I can see your faith. I can see your love. And be encouraged by the godly inheritance that you've received from your parents. 
In other words, Paul tells Timothy, young man, I thank God every time I remember you because it is evident from your faith and your love that the grace of God is with you. Who of us would not be encouraged by that? All of us can give this kind of encouragement to one another, and all believers need to receive this kind of encouragement. Let me just say this again. We absolutely must have encouragement if we are going to fulfill the calling of God upon our lives. We absolutely must have this. It is not an option. We need to receive it. We need to give it. Therefore, my brothers and sisters at Cache Valley Bible Fellowship, speak the truth in love to each other. Encourage one another and build one another up through words and letters and emails and phone calls and texts and getting together. Encourage one another. This is an essential part of how we love Jesus and how we serve God and how we ourselves are strengthened. Now, lastly, we see in this passage that we must ourselves fan the flame of the gift of God. We must ourselves fan the flame of the gift of God. And let's give verse 6 and 7 our consideration now. For this reason, Paul says, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. For this reason, what is the reason? It's everything that he has just said in verses 3 to 5, which is one whole package. Because I thank God for his work in your life, whenever I remember you and all these things about you, I therefore command you to fan into flame the gift of God that is in you. Or more simply, Timothy, because I know the gift of God is in you, I command you to fan it into flame. This is the only command in our passage, and it is the main point of this passage that we've read this morning. Everything else is leading to verse 6 and 7. All the encouragement that Paul has given to Timothy will fall on deaf ears if Timothy does not obey this command to fan into flame the gift of God. Though Paul doesn't explicitly say what the gift is, there's a basic agreement among commentators that it is, in the words of John Stott, I quote, the authority and power to be a minister of Christ. That is, it included both the office and the spiritual equipment needed to fulfill it. And we see this because Paul talks about the laying on of hands, which is referring to, Paul, to Timothy's commission to preach, his commission to lead, and the power of the Spirit to do that. Paul is now, what he's doing here is he's urging Timothy to take courage, rise up, Fulfill the call God has placed upon his life. Timothy's gift may be different than each one of our gifts. Not everyone is called to be a pastor. Not everyone's called to be an evangelist or an apostle. But we are all called to the service of Christ. And this same command applies to each one of us. So don't just think, oh, that's just for Timothy. This is for us all. Who God made you to be and the power to live out who you are, these things are a gracious gift from God to you which needs your response and your tending. And the same with me. Verse 7 is certainly true for all of us. Look at that again. God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I, I prefer that translation to self-control. He's given us a right mind. To live our lives according to the Spirit, according to who we are in Christ, is to live a life without fear. I mean, that's what God has for us. 
That's what the gospel provides for us. That's what the Holy Spirit empowers us to do, is to live a life without fear and to live a life with love. To live a life with a sound and healthy mind. This is what the Christian life is supposed to be. This is what God intends for us and provides for us. Now, please don't misunderstand verse 7. Because I know many of us are reading this and we're thinking, I don't feel that, right? I struggle with fear. I don't feel always empowered. I struggle to love. My mind doesn't always feel healthy. Verse 7 doesn't mean that every Christian experiences it. Verse 7 means that every Christian who has believed in Christ and has been given the Spirit is given the resources by God to experience this kind of life. And this is the kind of life God intends for us. This is the kind of spirit God has given us, not of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Now, we need to live into that. We need to walk in that. We need to stir that up. So please don't think this is, oh, if I don't experience this, I don't, I'm not a Christian. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying, Christian, this is what you are to live. And this is what you can live if you stir up the gift of God. It's ours for the having. It belongs to us if we apply ourselves to the truth and receive the encouragements that God has given. The spirit-filled life here is likened to a fire. Isn't that interesting? A fire needs fuel and oxygen. To blaze up a fire, you need to stoke it, and you need to blow on it. You need to put wood on it, and it can take a little bit of time. First the tinder, then the kindling, then the logs. And I think sometimes as Christians we get discouraged because we think, why isn't my life ablaze? I want to go from, you know, cold to blaze. And uh, we forget, with a fire, you can't go to 1 to 10 very easily, can you? You've got to build it. You've got to tend to it. You gotta take care of it so it doesn't go out and keep building it up and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter as you tend to it. When I was growing up, uh, our home was heated by wood exclusively. And we had a wood stove and even to this day, my parents heat their home with wood. But I remember coming home from wherever we were and you come back to a freezing cold house. <laughs> and uh, you know, you wish at that time you could just turn on the little radiator or something, and then the heat starts blasting, or the fan, you know. But no, we, we come home to a hold, cold house, and I remember all of us kind of rubbing our hands and waiting for my dad, and he's getting the newspaper out. And if you know my dad, he's kind of slow, and he opens up the newspaper, and he wants to read it, you know. And we're like, come on, Dad, and he crumples it up, and he puts it in there, and we're all waiting. But one of the things he did, and he does, is he would move the ashes, right? And we've been gone out of the house for hours and hours, but... You look into the stove and it looks like there's nothing in there, but he would move the ashes and he would, by moving the ashes, it would show that there were actually embers still alive under there. You guys see that, right? You know, you know what I'm talking about. And I think that that's how many of us are sometimes. We've grown so cold in our Christian lives. And it isn't that there is no fire, it's just buried under all the ashes. And we, we stir it up a little bit and we realize there's, there's the embers there. God has given it to us, the gift. But then we need to put the paper on and the kindling and the logs and pretty soon our house was warm and toasty. And it took a while though. I, I, it did take a while. But it got hot. And soon it was warming our cold bodies. I believe that God is saying this to us today, to each one of us who knows him at the beginning of this new year. It is time to fan into flame the gift of God that is within us, to live out who we are in Christ. We are recipients of the grace of God. We are his sons and daughters. We have great things to rejoice in and great work to do. And we have to fan into flame what God has given us. So in conclusion, as I finish this sermon, let me finish with 
some very practical things that we can do, in, in fact, that we must do, to fan into flame the gift of God that is within us this year. What, what is the fuel? What is the oxygen? How do we stoke it? How do we blow it? Well, let me give you 10 things we can do really briefly. I hope none of these things are surprising to you. Number one, every day, tell yourself the gospel. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, the problem with us is that we listen to ourselves more than we talk to ourselves. If we're passive, we're going to be listening to ourselves and it's not going to be encouraging. It's usually what comes up passively from our hearts is negative, right? Discouraging, pessimistic. But what we need to do is talk to ourselves and say, oh my soul, put your hope in God. O oh my soul, he has dealt bountifully with you. O oh my soul, remember today that Christ has died for your sins and has risen again. You talk to yourself because a life of gospel faithfulness is produced by the gospel itself. Tell yourself the gospel every day. And while you're at it, tell somebody else too. Number two, read and meditate upon God's word daily this year. The Bible repeatedly tells us that those who yield fruit in their season are those who meditate upon the word of God day and night. So I would encourage you to find a Bible reading plan. Those help some people. And be diligent in reading and meditating upon God's word each day. Formulate a plan. Because if we don't have a plan, we often will not do it. Number three, join a Bible study. Again, notice that I'm talking about ways that we expose ourselves to the gospel and to the nourishment that comes through the word of God. There's two Bible studies that our church provides, a women's Bible study on Wednesday mornings and a men's Bible study on Saturday mornings. And I'm sure there's other Bible studies in this valley you could find as well. But that is a powerful way to keep yourself nourished by the word of God. Number four, do not neglect fellowshipping with other believers. Decide right now at the beginning of 2024 that you will not decide whether to go to church each Sunday. You'll just go. None of this deciding to go to church each Sunday. You just go because God wants you to be there to serve your brothers and sisters and to be nourished by his word. Greet one another. Stay longer Give encouragement, but also be present and willing to receive encouragement from your brothers and sisters. Partake in the Lord's Supper, which is given for our remembrance and strengthening. Listen to your brothers and sisters. Listen carefully to the sermons, the preaching of the Word of God. This is a gift from God to us to strengthen us and put courage within us. Pray daily, number five. And often, the Bible tells us that this is one of the ways we are strengthened, is by casting ourselves upon the Lord in dependency, laying our requests before him. You remember what Paul says in Philippians, in everything by prayer, give thanks to God, cast your anxieties upon him, and he will sustain you. Six, sing. When at home, when walking, when at church, when driving, turn on worship music and sing. The scripture tells us, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. So many times, amen, that you, you, you feel like there's this great discouragement, and it's sometimes a song that gets through. A melody carrying the words of the gospel right into your heart. Seven, give and serve. Don't live your life this year and beyond for yourself, just to acquire and to live for your own pleasure. We are called as God's people to give and to serve. Practicing generosity with our money and with our time shapes us. And we find joy in serving the Lord and strength in that joy. Say yes to help somebody move. Say yes to plow a driveway. Thank you this morning, Troy. Say yes to clean tables. 
because we are shaped every time that we do or do not serve. Eight, repent of sin more quickly the more easily. If you have a guilty conscience about something that you've done or haven't done, confess it to a fellow brother or to a fellow sister or to your pastor. Don't hide your sins because they burden you and they prevent healing. Nine, throw off every weight. Hebrews 12, 1, when it talks about the race that we have to run, a race of endurance. It tells us not only to throw to get rid of our sinfulness, to our sins, to address those and confess those, but also to throw off the weights in our life. And the weights are activities or habits that are not sins, but that nevertheless hinder us from running well. So consider the habits that you have this year and choose better habits. Watch less TV and YouTube. Get rid of your phone if you have to or lock it up somewhere. Stop feeding on so much news Nothing throws sand on a fire these days like the news. Limit your diet of the news to once every few days, if that. Evaluate the habits. Ten, read a good book this year. We have a library at this church that's full of excellent books which will inform your mind and delight your soul and instruct you. And reading is a powerful exercise that shapes us and forms us. And if you need a recommend, I would always love to give you a book recommend. There's many things I could mention beyond these things, but all of these things are merely fuel and oxygen for the fire of our souls. These practices, don't mistake me, are not themselves what strengthen us. They are ways we open ourselves to the word of God and to the gospel of his grace, which strengthens us. It is by God's grace that we are strengthened through the diligent practice of hearing God's word. Each one of us, we're told here in verse 6, must take responsibility to fan into flame the gift of God which he has given us. So... Beloved believers in Jesus Christ, sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ, not because of your own worthiness or merits or anything like that, but simply because of who Jesus is and what he's done. Beloved believers, be encouraged today. The Lord is with you. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and the instruction we received from it. Strengthen us by the word of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.